Okay, I'm uh, really honored to be here and to talk. I was, uh, a few days ago, I was on this very beach in San Diego, so I just got back on Sunday and I'm just a little jet lagged. Uh, but uh, I think like Wendy speaking in French, uh, it slows her down a bit. I think jet lag is gonna slow me down a bit, so maybe it'll be more understandable. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the incredibly great pleasures of being a professor is uh, seeing students uh, develop in their careers. And it's been an absolute delight to see uh, Wendy's career uh, and uh, all that she's accomplished and doing. So it's, uh, it's especially nice to be here uh, for uh, this talk. Okay, uh, let's see if this is going to start. Uh, this is what I like to do. Uh, and I was doing that on Saturday. Uh, the waves were not as nice as this particular day, which was really a, a wonderful day. Uh, and uh, I left that for, uh, I'm here at the Institute for Advanced Studies uh, in Paris for the year. Uh, and not an unpleasant sight. This is out the front door of the Institute the first day I arrived in the fall. Uh, so exchanging one body of water for another. Uh, and uh, what I want to do today is to talk about um, what I call sort of thinking with computers. Uh, I, um, I want to sort of focus on, it's sort of a personal story about what I see as opportunities and challenges. Uh, and, uh, you know, for really, for far too long, we've uh, conceived of thinking is something that happens only in the head, only in the brain. But thinking really happens in the world as well as in the head. We think with things, we think with our bodies, we make marks on paper, uh, we pick up salt and pepper shakers to, in a restaurant to talk about an auto accident and the pepper becomes one car and the salt becomes another car. Uh, and today we increasingly think with computers. So lots of, uh, uh, of our activities are computer mediated. We're, you know, my grandson, if a question comes up, he tells me, just ask Google, you know? Uh, and, uh, and, the, um, and I think it's both for good and for ill uh, that computers now permeate the fabric of society. Uh, you know, they not only connect uh, our activities to ever expanding information resources with previously unimaginable computational power. Already this morning, there have been billions of online searches uh, throughout the world. And each one of those searches took the equivalent computing power of all the computing that went into the Apollo project that landed a human on a moon. And it's just astounding you know, I think it's hard to wrap our heads around how much computer power uh, we have. And, and, you know, and my view is that more and more of that computer power should be going to help people. But it's really a lot of it's going to sell your eyeballs and to sell advertising and that. So there's a, there's a dark side to, I think, what's going on now. And I think we're, we're sort of starting to see the, you know, sort of the, the risks of this kind of computer-mediated kind of activity. We're, we're seeing deepening inequities, uh, reinforcing injustices, and fostering disconnects in society. I mean, we see this polarization of political positions throughout the world. Uh, and, and, and a lot of that is really due to this being computer-mediated and computers being involved in, in the essence of that. So what I'm going to do today is, is tell you a little story from the perspective I have of sort of, uh, sort of taking a distributed cognition perspective of sort of like trying to expand and think about thinking as being something that is expanded beyond the cranium that happens in the world and with other people and with artifacts and with computers and, and things. And, and the, the challenges I sort of see of of interacting with this digital world, where this divide between the physical world and the virtual world is becoming permeable. You know, we're, we're you know, wearing glasses that let us see superimposed upon the world information. 
And you know, which is the world? Is it that information that we're seeing, or is it the physical world? But a world in which we, we just increasingly think with computers. So I want to tell a story. And I always like to begin with this quote of uh, Peter Medawar. Peter Medawar is a biologist, a Nobel laureate. Uh, and, and Peter had this great phrase about science begins as a story about a possible world, a story which we invent and criticize and modify as we go along. So it ends up being as nearly as we can make it a story about real life. And I think that really describes a lot of the physical sciences, You know that what we're trying to do is to sort of explain the world. And we have these theories, and we do experiments, and we, we narrow down the theory and, and, and make it better and better. But I think one of the wonderful things about human-computer interaction and computer science in general is that we can make a lot of our stories true, at least some of our stories true, by building things, by designing systems, uh, by you know, creating you know, uh, uh, search techniques that let us bring together all of this information in the world. Uh, and I think that that's really sort of different, that we can, can make our science and our stories true by, by building things. You know, the biologists are starting to do this. You know, they're hacking the body. You know, the vaccines that we've all had have, you know, have, have programmed our body, you know, to that. So, you know, they're moving along in that same kind of direction. Uh, and, you know, so, and for me, ideas and research projects have histories. And, and just like people that you know, you can't really understand them without knowing some of their history of their background. And I think ideas are like that. If I were fortunate to come back and have another a lifetime, I think I would focus on intellectual history. I think like looking at the development of ideas and how they developed and why they developed, you know, is just a really fascinating and important thing. Uh, and so I'm trying to talk a little bit about my personal history. Uh, and try to summarize some of the lessons from it. So I'm going to tell you about a bunch of research projects. I probably have too many. Wendy will cut me off at some appropriate time, uh, and, uh, and we will conclude. Uh, but the, the real goal, the, you know, my goal is to really try to convince you. And Wendy gave you this whirlwind tour of the development of psychology and a lot of studies of cognition and stuff. Uh, and and I think we have, to, we have to come to a thing to really understand how important those kinds of understandings about people are, of understanding cognition and understanding human activity. You know, we just know absolutely too little about what people really do. You know, and a lot of my interests and in things we develop have really grown out of looking at what people really do. We don't even know very much about what we really do ourselves. You know, and, and I think it's, it's got to be the touchstone for designing computationally based systems, that it has to start with people, an understanding of people, if we're going to build systems that really uh, are supportive of people. Uh, and, you know, in thinking about putting together this, this story, uh, I think it's really homage to Wendy uh, in her PhD thesis at MIT. Uh, brought up this, this notion of co-adaptive systems. Uh, and I think that that underlying, I think we both feel very strongly that that's the future of design in HCDI. You know, systems that sort of adapt to us and are such that we can adapt them to, to our needs, rather than most of the systems today where all the adaptation is on our side. You know, we have to somehow make them work uh, kind of things. Uh, and uh, anyway, so today's story is, uh, is, is sort of a, uh, you know, I want to end with some current uh, work uh, that we're doing on trying to put together a international research network uh, to look at what we're calling uh, human-centered information spaces. But I think, you know, one way of viewing that is I think it's sort of one of the bases for building these kind of co-adaptive systems that I'm sure that Wendy will talk a lot more about later in this series of lectures. Uh, so anyway, my story begins with um, when I was a kid, uh, and I was sort of a math nerd, uh, and I, was, I, I became really interested in representations, you know, of mathematical kinds of representations. 
And the thing that started it all for me was uh, a proof of, of all things. Uh, and uh, it was a proof of that the, uh, the real numbers are not countably infinite. And uh, I vividly remember being a kid and being in bed and reading this proof of Cantor. Uh, it was a famous diagonal proof of Cantor and actually falling out of bed and running to tell my mom about this, who didn't appreciate it at all, you know, uh, you know why I was so excited about this. But it sort of, to me, it was, it was, I saw this representation that let me understand something about uncountably infinite numbers. I mean, just sort of this very abstract thing. And it's a beautiful visual proof, and I can, I can give it to you in a second. So uh, Cantor said that, well, you know, if, if, if these real numbers, we could list them all. You know, we have this infinite long list of real numbers. And they would be countable if we could put them into one-to-one -one correspondence with the integers. You know, so suppose we did that, and we had that list of these countably infinite. And then Cantor had this brilliant kind of representation, very visual, of what if I drew a diagonal through all those numbers, an infinitely long diagonal through those numbers. And then if I read the number off of that diagonal, it's another number. And what if I changed that by, you know, say, subtracting one from each one of the positions? And then what, what Cantor you know, uniquely sort of said with this is that number could not have been in this list. You know, it's an infinitely long list. But if that number had been in the list, it would have been cut in one position. It would be different from this number. So, you know, it just like was mind blowing to me. I mean, it was like, you know, this is amazing that I can understand something about uncountably infinite numbers. And it was all due to a kind of representation that, that, you know, that made it clear to me as a human. It was a visual kind of representation. It was a visual proof. Uh, and I got interested in that. I was a math major as an undergrad, and I thought I was going to become a mathematician. And, and, uh, and I spent my whole misspent undergraduate career uh, looking for a counterexample to a famous problem. For hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, people had had this conjecture uh, that's known as the four-color conjecture. And the conjecture is that for any planar map, like this map of the US, that you only need four colors such that you can color the map so across every boundary it's a different color. And everyone, you know, had mathematicians had tried to prove this for hundreds of years. And it was talked about the, as a four-color disease because it was passed down from, you know, one generation to the next of people working on it. So I was convinced uh, uh, that I was going to find the counterexample. There's got to be a counterexample if you can't prove it. There's got to be a map that takes five colors to cover. And so I got into computing, and I got into programming, trying to build a, programs to look for this counterexample. Fortunately, it turns out shortly thereafter it was proven to be true. You know, and I could still be looking for that counterexample today, and I would have never have found it. Uh, but, uh, but it got me into thinking about graph theory and, and programming computers and, and doing all that. So it was still profitable. So I want to give you a problem to sort of try to convince you of the power of, of representation. Uh, and this is a famous uh, uh, problem that I actually got from Seymour Papert, who uh, Seymour Papert and, and Marvin Minsky was visiting UCSD uh, and uh, they're the people who started the AI lab at MIT. Very interesting, strange, strange and interesting folks. And, uh, and they pose this problem called the string around the world problem. And so what I want you to envision is two spheres. One of them, the world. And this is the famous blue marble first picture of the Earth from space, which is, you know, has been such a powerful thing you know, environmentally and otherwise, of thinking about the world as we're all on this one planet. And, uh, and, and, and then a basketball. Uh, and, uh, and I want you to uh, mentally wrap a string 
around the world at the equator and, and mentally wrap a string around the basketball. Uh, and now I want you to think about adding string to each so that you can move that string up a foot off the world and off the basketball. So you're going to add more string to be able to move it up a, a foot. And, and, uh, and, uh, and I want you to think about the length of string that you need to add in both cases. You know, the string, how much string do you have to add to move this string up a, a foot around the whole world? And how much string do you need to add to move it up a foot off of a basketball? Now, if you're like most people, you don't know how much string. But your, your intuition is that it's going to take a whole hell of a lot more string to move this up a foot off the world everywhere than a foot off of the basketball. So you might be surprised if you think like that, and most people do. But it's actually the same amount of string to, to do that. Uh, and it sort of goes against your whole gut feeling. I mean, how could adding the same amount of string move the string up off the world as off the basketball? So let me show you a representation, help us think about that. So representations are always abstractions. They're always simplifications of things. And a well-chosen uh, representation can help us think of, so, you know, maybe spheres are too complex. So let's think of it as a square. Just a simple square. So here we have a square, and, and we have this red string around the square. And now if we cut that string at the corners of the square, we can move out those pieces of string a foot off of that square. And it sort of starts to become clear that we're going to add two feet of string at each corner. So we're going to add eight feet of string. And I've never really said how big this square is. So if we're going to do that with a really small square or a big square, we still can see that we're going to add two feet of string at each one of the, the corners. So we're going to add a constant amount of string, no matter the size of the square. And you might have thought about it, you know, uh, uh, as, you know, circumference equals 2 pi r. You know, and that's another kind of representation. And one of the things about representations is often anything that's worth representing is worth representing multiple ways. And each representation has certain advantages and disadvantages. But we can see here in that representation, if we add one to the radius, we're going to add two pi string, a constant amount, no matter what r is. So that's, you know, that's sort of the power for me of representation, is that it helps us think about the world. It helps us to do things. Uh, but representation always involves a process of interpretation. You know, often that's done by us, you know, that we're looking at these mathematical things. We're looking at these, these squiggles we call words and stuff, and we're interpreting them. So it's always that kind of representation, structural representation process pair. And pro the process can be really complex and intricate. Uh, and one of the famous examples of this was uh, a friend of mine is a psychologist in Japan, uh, Sayaki. Uh, Sayaki used to, when I first came to UCSD, he was a common visitor, and we interacted a lot. And, and Sayaki looked at this task, and if you take a a sort of a normal psychology course. One of the things that you'll come across are these famous studies of Shepard and Metzler about mental rotation. And you've probably seen these. And the, so what they showed people to are these 3D block figures. And, and they ask them, they print a pair, and they ask them if they're the same or different uh, kind of thing. And, and you get this sort of very interesting finding. If you take how long it takes people to make that decision, it's a direct linear function of the angle of rotation. So if the, if the two block faders are, are the same and they're only rotated a little, you're really quick. But if they're rotated a lot more, you're a lot slower. You get this linear function. And you know everyone has replicated this. But, but Saki was always like, he just had this different view of things. And he really, I think, I think this study for me sort of really be, became the beginnings of, of what we now call embodied cognition. 
the fact that we, we're, we're in bodies moving in the world, and that makes a difference in the way we think about the world and the way we think. So Sayaki did this really interesting manipulation. So when he was explaining this study to people, he drew a human head on the, the 3D block figure. And with this human head, you can sort of feel that that's your red arm sticking out, and that's your legs, and they're bent, and that's your knees. And he did that only when he was explaining this. And then he showed the same you know, kind of 3D cube kinds of things to focus. But he sort of induced people to think about the cubes not as these abstract things, but as human bodies. And, and what he gets is this very different finding, this red line on that. So instead of this linear function increasing, it's almost flat. So no matter how much it's turned, we sort of know instantly if we're thinking about it as our body. I mean, we know a lot about bodies. We spend a lot of time moving and touching and dealing with things. And so we get this very different thing. And for me, it's both the beginnings of this notion of we have to think about embodied cognition that we're, you know, we're embodied in this world and we're interacting with it. But it, but it also you know, it has a thing of like representation. It's pretty, a pretty subtle manipulation to change this pretty startling finding you know, of, uh, that we're thinking about. OK, this, uh, this kind of representations, uh, and you know, it's now called information visualization, uh, sort of graphical representation of information. You know, uh, it is, you know, one of the things if I were, you know, uh, looking at intellectual history, I would like try to understand why this came so late. It's only in the late 18th centuries that we started to have these kind of representations. And a lot of them came from uh, William Playfield and Charles Monaro. And these are uh, some of Playfield's representation. He had this really interesting political atlas book. But it was the first time people represented things like balance of trade this way. That we as humans, we can just read this off. You know, we could look at a bunch of numbers and never really be able to easily see this. But graphically, you know, being spatial creatures, you know, it's very common to us. He did the, he did the first like bar charts there. Uh, he did these wonderful things of biography. And this is just a little piece of it. The actual chart he built was two feet by three feet. It had 2,000 people represented. So you could see who lived at the same time and how much they overlapped and that. Uh, so really powerful for us as humans to have these kind of visual representations. And then Menard did this wonderful thing that you know, Tufte uh, has sort of popularized as being this incredibly Interesting chart. This is Napoleon's march on Moscow. And it's a, just a very powerful graphic. Because here in the, in the brown is the size of the army that left. And the black is the size of the army that returned. You know, and in this, this present time, thinking about war and thinking about invasions and thinking about all the deaths that are going to, to result from that, having it graphically portrayed here. But it's interesting information-wise in that it has many kinds of things. It has location. It has time. It has a graph of temperature. Actually, most of the deaths occurred because people froze to death uh, during this time uh, kind of thing. But, but it, it, it's sort of a human you know, kind of thing. You get this you know, sort of interesting group that sort of didn't go to Moscow. They sort of wintered over here and then just came back. But a lot of folks in that thing still froze to death, uh, and there were lows. So anyway, so you know, graphical kinds of representations are uh, incredibly powerful for us as humans. Uh, and uh, when I was putting this together, I looked at the, uh, this is uh, uh, a chart. It's called a map of the market. Uh, and uh, it's a technique uh, uh, looking at some hierarchical thing. It's a really interesting technique to look at your disk usage and where big files are and stuff. And here you can sort of see the different sectors of the US stock market uh, and you know, whether they're uh, increasing or decreasing in value. So you can get, you know, it's an amazing amount of data that we can sort of see that you know, technology is not doing well on this day. This was like Wednesday of last week uh, when I did this, uh, uh, put this together. 
Uh, and uh, you know, there are a few things that are doing well in financial services. And then I did it again this morning. Uh, and it's interactive. I mean, the market looks better. But still, Facebook, uh, this is over the last month performance. So Facebook has fallen almost 30%. You know, Zuckerberg took a cut of loss of billions of dollars. Couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, you know, but graphically, it's, it's like a, you know, just if you sort of realize the amount of information we're looking at and how interpretable it is to us. I mean, that's like a lot of the power of this kind of thing. But, you know, that last chart is, is actually uh, interactive. Uh, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, how do I go back? Sorry. Uh, so, you know, I'm just moving my mouse over Facebook and it's popping out this information. So it's a different kind of thing of being interactive. And that really came to us from this guy. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, Ivan Sutherland uh, in 1963 uh, did this PhD thesis that sort of like has all the big ideas of our field. You know, it has the idea of dynamic graphics, of windows, of object-oriented programming, of, you know, uh, two-handed interaction, of, of, of uh, he used a light pen, but of a pencil kind of interaction. You know, and it's just, it's, it's a mind-blowing PhD dissertation. I, I ask my students to read this all the time because, you know, you should do something like this. It sort of defines the whole field and, and, uh, and that. But, but it really brings kind of interactivity to this kind of thing, that these kind of computationally based representations can be interactive. Uh, and, and then a decade later, in 1973, uh, this is a machine that like totally changed my life. Uh, this is a Xerox Alto, uh, and, um, and designed at Xerox Park by Chuck Thacker and a bunch of really interesting folks. And at this time, I was a postdoc at Stanford in the AI lab. And the AI lab was like one hill over from Park. Uh, but I had spent almost all my time at Park because I just fell in love with this machine, you know? And, and it was like, it was a deep, deep infatuation. You know, it was, it was like a time when computing was done by punch cards, you know? And, uh, and, and day turnarounds for this kind of thing. And suddenly you had this graphical display and, and you could interact with it. And, and, you know, and almost, you know, it's, it's really literally no different than what we have today. You know, it's, you know, it's exactly the same thing. It was Ethernet connectivity, laser printing, email. Uh, they built this Bravo editor, which actually became Microsoft Word uh, later. Uh, you know, all of these kind of ideas of desktop, uh, you know, uh, uh, metaphor for uh, interacting, uh, and, uh, and all of these ideas of sort of living in the future. I mean, they sort of, it was a very interesting kind of place where there wasn't a lot of top-down direction, you know, and, uh, and, and the idea was to spend a lot, I mean, this machine cost about $100,000 in those, in those days. But the idea was to build, was sort of to build the future and then live in it, you know. As a, and we don't, we're not doing quite enough of that today, uh, kind of thing of, of doing that. And Alan Kay's famous quote: "The best way to predict the future is to invent it," uh, kind of thing. But it really, you know, personally, you know, just you know, I didn't know when I sat down. I, mean, I had no idea what I was going to do, but I knew it was going to be with stuff like this. I mean, it was just like a complete change of of direction for me. Uh, and then it's got brought to the rest of us with another decade. Uh, and in 1984, uh, at the Super Bowl, there was an ad from Apple introducing the Macintosh. Uh, and it brought all these ideas. Jobs had gone over to visit Park in previous and sort of seen the Alto and you know, went back to Apple to build something that, uh, that uh, he could sell at a thing. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and unfortunately, things have not evolved much since then, you know, uh, in, in lots of ways. Uh, and, you know, when I was putting this together and, you know, sort of humor me, uh, I got like, you know, what are all the machines that have been important in my life? So, you know, it started with the Alto at Park, 
And over at the AI lab, we had one of these PDB tents, a sort of big wall of machine uh, kind of things. And then I went to UCSD, and we had a PDP 1145, 750, 780, and, and what then was the uh, beginning of the cognitive science uh, lab at things, but in those days it was called the LNR lab, Lindsay Norman and Romahart. And then my next really deep infatuation was with these uh, MIT list machines, uh, company main symbolics. And these were machines that were, again, single user like the Alto, designed to run this language of, of artificial intelligence list, but you know, incredibly powerful. It was sort of like sitting down at the Alto, but many years later, uh, and living in the future of what computing could be like in the future. Uh, and then, you know, uh, we had machines like the three words perk, which actually Michelle uh, used at one point. Uh, the only person I met in many years who has any experience with that. Uh, this was a spinoff of Carnegie Mellon. And then we had this, uh, at UCSD, we built a system called UCSD Pascal. Uh, and we had one of the first sort of inexpensive bitmap displays, this little microprocessor called a Terak. And then I moved to very expensive SGI machines to do things we're doing, but it's a personal tour. So what I want to do is, uh, is, is look back on different phases of work and, and talk about the challenge and opportunity, because challenge and opportunities always go together. I mean, it's, it's the, the challenge that we have uh, that presents sort of the opportunity. And I think the first challenge and opportunity that I experienced was this focus on human-centered design, of sort of starting with people in the design. And when I first came to UCSD, uh, we did this book called User-Centered System Design, which was quite influential. And we purposely chose that title to get the UCSD acronym uh, in the thing. Uh, unfortunately, it got lost, and people sort of started talking about user-centered design. Uh, and I've never liked this term user. It just has too many bad connotations for me. I sort of like human-centered, starting with, with humans. But we built uh, a lot of systems. And, and one of the systems that we built in those days uh, was a system called Steamer. But what we were really interested in was, well, what I was really interested in is how could I get enough funding to buy list machines, which were very expensive? And so I had to put a proposal together that would, would bring me that kind of money. So what we were interested in is how people understand complex dynamic systems. You know, it was a time when uh, we were sort of people were first starting to talk about mental models. You know, not the kind of models that you have in physics textbooks about the world but the kind of models we as humans use. You know, you operate a, you know, all of these complex machines, cars and computers and stuff, and you don't, you know, most of us don't have the kind of model that a physicist might have about that. And even physicists don't use that model, those models in everyday kind of thing. They use these very informal qualitative kinds of models. And we were very interested, could we take these kind of very powerful, highly graphical systems and build instructional things that would help people build those kind of models, would build the kind of models that people used. So we spent a lot of time, and we ended up building a system to teach about steam propulsion. If you look at big Navy ships, they're, most of them are still powered by steam. Uh, and it's a really complex kind of system. Uh, and, and so we took a, a, a highly accurate mathematical model, but build a very qualitative graphical interface to it so that one could operate that complex thing and watch its operation at many different levels, sort of to zoom down through them. Uh, and that's you know one of our colleagues uh, there in the list machine with uh, the basic steam cycle and operating that. And we built a graphical editor to build these kind of things, one of the first sort of object-oriented graphic editors for that kind of thing. But we also built things on little Terra computers and other computers on, on the PERC uh, to train, to help people understand navigation. Uh, and there's all kinds of navigation problems that get solved in the Navy or you know any ship. Uh, 
And one of the powers we found was representation. So on the ship, you get a radar kind of plot, which shows you the relative position of things to you. But people generally think about things in, in sort of geographical, sort of a bird's eye view of that. Uh, and, uh, and lots of the confusions went away when people could manipulate things so they could do things in one representation and see the effect in the other. So here you can have a ship that's stationary, but it's giving a trail relative to you on the radar plot. And that was very confusing to a lot of folks. But if you could see it both on the geographic plot and the radar plot, you know, we had Navy chiefs who had taught this for a decade. And they had like light bulb experiences. You know, they'd come to me and say, I, after all these years, I finally understand, you know, what's going on kind of thing. And that's, that's the kind of thing that was exciting about the power of that. But all of that sort of, I think, was done because we sort of began with trying to understand how people thought about these kind of things. So we spent a lot of time in Navy schools looking at instruction, uh, taking the instruction ourselves. Uh, another project that I did that has the same bearing is we got really interested in, you know, all of us still, you know, people are taking paper notes. I mean, there's lots of advantages to paper, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, it's a wonderful medium. You know, it doesn't require power. You know, it's, you know, we're, we can sketch things very, you know, sketching has sort of been taken away from us on most computers. We don't do that. Uh, and so we, there's this technology of a digital pen that Wendy also did a lot of work with. But we got really enamored of this kind of idea that most of what people were trying to do is replace paper with digital. But paper has all of these advantages, you know. So couldn't we have the best of both worlds? So we got involved in this thing of, of building what we called, in France, what we called paper augmented digital uh, documents so that we could, instead of like replacing one or the other, we had both. So you could do things on paper, you could take that into the digital world, do things that are easier to do in the digital world, put that back on paper, interact with it uh, on that way. And again, it was sort of this idea of looking at people first and what people, and you know, uh, and, you know it's, it's still it's unfortunately not, you know, been sort of developed as much as it should be, you know, kind of thing. I mean, the companies are, uh, a Swedish company, Anoto, that has these very tight patents on the technology. Uh, we had to reverse engineer these pens to do a lot of the kinds of things. Okay, so, uh, so from this phase, you know, what I sort of, is sort of, one is the importance of mental models, of starting with people, how they think about the world. Another sort of lesson is the power of dynamic graphics. We're fundamentally spatial creatures. You know, being able to interact with it. And there's something about us as humans that doing something and having the system do something back. You know, that, that I mean, that's why, it's one of the reasons that, you know, people are addicted to computer games and these pretty stupid games that are, but they have this kind of human-like, we do something, the world does something. And that's, that's very compelling to us. Um, I think, you know, we built a steamer system. It went into Navy schools. Uh, this uh, MOBOR, this navigational system, went on to every ship in the Navy, in the US Navy. There's something, you know, it's very hard to do, but there's something incredibly powerful about building stuff that really gets used. Uh, and, you know, it keeps you honest. It keeps you, you know, really focused on the real problems. Uh, and, and another thing I learned is just the value of, of combining field work with systems building, that you know, going back and forth between those two is really a powerful kind of thing. Uh, and, and then you know, we built this graphics editor to build these kind of things, uh, and building tools to help you build interfaces, incredibly powerful lesson from all of this. Uh, something that we spent a lot of time looking at, sort of zoomable interfaces. We did these sort of early work of the, of zoomable interfaces, the kind that we now do on all kinds of things with pinching and stuff. But we really explored something that's more and more powerful called semantic zooming. So instead of just geometric scaling, you know, 
as you zoom into something, you get a different view of it. You know, so you zoom into a book and you see the outline of the book, and you zoom into a chapter and you see outline of that uh, kind of thing, which I think is, is underexplored and we're trying to, to get back to. Uh, and then I think looking back on it, I think one of the, you know, <laughs> these were incredibly ambitious things to take this list machine, put it into Navy schools and do this. And, and I think a lot of it came just that we were so naive, you know, that we were willing to take on this project that was, you know, uh, just very complex. Uh, and, and it turned out to be a, re a really good thing to do. Okay, the second point I want to make is about uh, activity, uh, the importance of capturing activity. Uh, and uh, over the years, I learned a lot about uh, ethnography from two of the, uh, the world's great ethnographers. Uh, I shared a lab for uh, many, many years with Ed Hutchins, who's a cognitive anthropologist, uh, and interacted a lot with Chuck Goodwin. Uh, and this is actually Ed. In anthropology, you go off and do field work for a year or so. And Ed went to New Guinea and looked at land lit litigation of how land got passed down when someone died. Uh, and, um, and one of the things that sort of really impacted me was uh, just how important, uh, you don't see it well, but this is a, this big thing here that he has strapped around his neck as a tape recorder. And so it allowed him to record the conversations that were going on and, to, and then to study those, to study the interaction. And, and the technology made it possible to do the research and to be able to capture that kind of thing. Uh, and, and that influenced the next thing I'll talk about a lot. Uh, and then Chuck Goodwin uh, uh, re recently died a couple of years ago, but was just a, a phenomenal ethnographer. Uh, Ed, who I have the highest regard for, Ed once introduced Chuck as he's the best person at doing what I do. You know, and, you know, and that was quite some praise uh, for someone. And, and Chuck looked at a lot of just, he and his wife, Cindy, looked at things like kids playing hopscotch and the, the richness of the communication that goes on there, how kids communicate with body posture or their movement of that. And uh, this uh, elderly gentleman uh, was Chuck's father and, uh, <clears throat> and he had a stroke and he could only say three words. He could say yes, no, and and, the word and. And what Chuck was able to document by videotaping and studying is just how an active participant in conversations his father was by gesturing and pointing and facial expressions and all of that. You know, and sort of this, you know, the richness of being able to communicate when you only have three words, but you can, you know, go to the restaurant you want and, and you know, express your dissatisfaction at something that happens in the house and stuff. Uh, and, uh, but, but, and, and Chuck was just the master of, of looking at, at video of real activity and being able to, to see deeply into it of what was going on. So I got interested in sort of activity histories um, in a uh, auto repair shop in, uh, in Texas, in Austin, Texas. Uh, and I had an old car. Uh, I just actually rebuilt it. Uh, it's a 1973 Porsche 911 E Targa. Uh, and I, but it broke down when I was there. And I ended up in this repair shop. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I just bored waiting, and I kept looking at all these manuals they used, and, uh, and I got really interested in them that, uh, that mechanics' hands are dirty, and when they go through these manuals, the manuals get dirty, but they get the dirtiest at the places that they use the most. So it's sort of like their activity has representational consequences. So if you walk up the stairs here in many of the older buildings, you see where people had walked. The stairs are worn. You just see the patina on door handles from the acid on things. So, or you see like, 
you know, where people, there's no sidewalks and people just naturally walk. You know, they leave these trails like up in the top left corner. So people do things in the world. Some of those kinds of things have representational consequences. A uh, paperback book opens to the last, a you know, new paperback book opens to the last part you were reading. So some of them are useful. But we got, I, you know, if you abstract that though, and sort of say that you want people to just sort of do what they normally do, but especially in a computational medium, it can have representational consequences. So we did the first sort of really detailed uh, modifies of editor, you know, a lot like track changes in Microsoft Word these days, but keep these very detailed editing histories of papers or code. And then we represented it in the scroll bar over on the right, what we called an attribute map scroll bar. Uh, so you could see, like, if, if Wendy and I were working on a paper together, I could see where Wendy had edited parts of the things. And it was sort of nice to do it in the scroll bar because you just touch that section and you go to it in the editor. Uh, and we can record all kinds of things, how long it took, uh, all kinds of things. And so I sort of started to get this view that you know, doing things in a computational medium can have all of these kind of good representational consequences of that. Uh, and I've done a, a lot of uh, recording of activity uh, since that. We've done a lot of looking at um, driving. Uh, we put 10 cameras in a car and we look at what people really do in driving. Uh, I'm gonna show you a little video of a tool we built to help analyze this kind of of, of data, uh, and, and lately we've been looking at uh, uh, sort of uh, the kind of search activity that a uh, researcher does when they're uh, working on a paper or working on uh, research kind of things. You know, they're on in, you know, Google Scholar and they're going to taking notes and stuff, and so we've been taking very detailed records of, of what people do uh, we recently looked at um, sort of uh, this kind of computational notebooks that are uh, being used by journalists and scientists with increasing things, uh, Jupyter notebook, other kinds of, of notebooks. Uh, and only in this day and age, we, we grabbed a million Jupyter notebooks off of GitHub. Uh, and we did an analysis of this, it was like, you know, simple analysis of how much was code how much was markup, how much were diagrams, uh, kind of thing. Okay, I have 10 minutes. I'm, uh, I can give any talk in any amount of time. So, uh, uh, and, uh, but, you know, but looking at that, that history of those kind of notebooks uh, uh, is also, and I, I just, I think, again, I'll say again, that we just don't know enough about what people really do. So uh, when we put 10 cameras in the car, we had, uh, you know, the first ever foot cam, because we wanted to know what people do with their feet. We had cameras looking out the front. We had uh, cameras on glasses, so we saw this very first person view. Uh, and uh, we had access to the bus of the car. You know, cars are just computing platforms now. They're just like a bunch of computers tied together on a network. Uh, and so we could get all these very detailed records. And this is sort of what some of the data looked like. Uh, and, uh, uh, and here is a, a guy driving this car for actually the first time. Uh, and you'll notice he has like one finger on the steering wheel. You know, uh, a little bit later, I won't show you the segment, but he almost gets in an accident. Uh, and he uh, touches the steering wheel with his other hand briefly and jokes about, uh, I guess I'm the first person that almost wrecked your car uh, kind of thing. But very... Very interesting uh, uh, record of activity. Okay, I want to uh, maybe end up with uh, this. Uh, I think I think a, a very important part of the future of design is is knowing a lot more about what people really do. Uh, and uh, and this is an example. And a lot of this work with you know we have ten camera video feeds in a car. Uh, uh, it's a very rich data set. It's very difficult to analyze. And, uh, and so we built a tool to help us analyze uh, this kind of data. And uh, the tool uh, 
This is an example of some work with Ed uh, Hutchins. Uh, and uh, Ed was looking at uh, uh, commercial aviation, what goes on in the cockpit. Uh, and uh, this is uh, two commercial pilots uh, flying in a high fidelity simulator at Boeing. Uh, and so we have access to uh, the simulator data, what's going on in the simulator. Uh, we have video of them. Uh, we had a number of people uh, in the middle there uh, taking uh, paper notes with these Anoto pens. Uh, we had a transcript uh, of what they were saying. Uh, we had a, a map of where they were flying uh, at the time. Uh, and, um, and it's just very hard to analyze this kind of rich data. So one of the things we thought was a real kind of win we to focus on a tool to help us. So we built a system called ChronoViz. Uh, and I'll show you just a little bit of a, a video of it. Uh, we recently added the ability to link eye tracking data with the rest of the data in ChronoViz. In this example, we have data collected during a flight simulation. Gaze position was recorded with a glasses mounted mobile eye tracking system and synchronized for analysis within ChronoViz with multiple high definition videos a simulator data log, and manually transcribed audio. First, we can view the gaze position overlaid on the scene camera from the eye tracking glasses. The current gaze position is shown as a moving dot, with the trail leading up to the dot showing the path of the gaze for a short period before. Since the gaze data is linked with the rest of the data collected during the simulation, the researcher can use the combined data set to quickly answer questions about what the pilot was looking at during interesting moments in the flight such as using the transcript to go to the point in the gaze data when the pilots were talking about the flight plan, or using the simulator data to go to the point in the gaze data when the pilots started to descend for landing. The eye tracking system used during this simulation also produced gaze points that were aligned with a plane in the world that was defined through the use of infrared markers placed in the cockpit during data collection. With this data, we can visualize the aggregate data over a static image of the instrument panel of the flight simulator. To further explore this data, the researcher can dynamically select regions of the gaze data. On a timeline below the gaze data, colored bars represent points in time when the gaze was directed toward that area. The researcher can then click on the colored bars to move to the corresponding points in the other visualized data streams. Finally, we can visualize transition probabilities between the selected regions. These are dynamically updated as the researcher adjusts the selected regions and can represent transitions over the entire data set or just for a segment of time selected on the timeline. ChronoViz supports inclusion of multiple sets of gaze data. In this data set, we have data from both the pilot and co-pilot, and can use this to help understand how they coordinate their attention. The interactive visualizations in ChronoViz are designed to give researchers both the freedom to explore and ask questions about the data, as well as the power to perform detailed analyses. Using these multiple linked visualizations of eye tracking data and other recorded data, Researchers are able to navigate the dataset in a variety of ways and gain a rich understanding of the activity. Okay, uh, I'll try to end up and have some time for questions. Uh, we've also been looking at this in uh, uh, interaction that goes on in a medical office. Uh, this is a clinic in southeast San Diego. Uh, in the middle, uh, the back on the uh, woman on the left is a physician. Uh, the person uh, to her right on the table is a patient, uh, but there's also an interpreter because she doesn't speak the language of the patient. So really, really complex social setting kinds of interaction. Uh, and we've been trying to understand that uh, in ways. And one of the things we've added is uh, use of depth cameras to be able to uh, tell where people are pointing, when they're pointing, who's talking uh, kind of things. Uh, but, uh, but I guess the summary thing is, uh, I, I think it's this kind of analysis that needs to be done uh, for building systems that are really supportive of people. Uh, and uh, so anyway, so maybe I'll end with that. Uh, I just want to skip through a lot of things. And writ large. No, is I don't want to show that. <laughs> we'll go back. Sorry. Uh, I just want to mention... In the end, we've, uh, what we're currently working on is uh, what we call a human-centered uh, information space. 
Uh, and we've um, now uh, the world is broken up into all these apps and stuff. Uh, and uh, and every company is trying to keep you in their ecosystem. So there are these walled gardens that are they're building up. Uh, and uh, and each of those apps has sort of refined itself. So we have you know really good editors. We have really good that. But real work extends across that. If you think back to the last time you were working on a project, you know, you had a bunch of browser tabs opened, you were doing uh, chat with folks, you might be looking at videos, uh, you're searching for things on the web uh, kind of thing. And what we think is that there's a real opportunity not to compete with all of these apps, but to link to them and build a sort of very personal information space that's your information organized the way you want to organize it, that, that sort of mines your activity history to represent things about it. So one of the things we're really looking at, and uh, how to say this in a few minutes, if, if, you, if you record your activity on your computer, lots of free software to do that kind of thing, and then look at it later, of your own activity. If you look at someone else's activity, it's almost uninterpretable. But if you look at your own activity, what you comes to mind is why you clicked on that link, why you went to that website, why you decided to do you know, various things. And we think that that's the kind of information that people need. We would like to have in this personal information space sort of the equivalent of the kinds of things that happen on uh, series on TV, so it's a multi career series, and often at the beginning of that next episode, they show you this really brief thing, and you know it's like a mirror watching Breaking Bad, and and they show you this really brief segment, and and if you've seen the, the early segments, it comes to oh yeah, that drug deal was going down, and they just went to Mexico, and and all of that kind of stuff. But if you haven't seen it, nothing much. We'd like to, as one of the components of this, of this personal information space, have that kind of thing where you go back to a project you were working on a week ago or a month ago. Why don't you have some brief little thing that plays for you? It's a movie of you, you know, and because it's you, it's very interpretable, you know, to get you back into you know, things when you're interrupted, to get back into state. But one of many things we think in this and so I've written a couple of proposals since I've been here in, in Paris, and one of them is to put together this international network uh, to, uh, to help design this sort of human information space. Uh, lots of folks here in Paris, uh, people at Aarhus and, and, uh, and in the States and stuff. So anyway, I think I'll end there, and uh, thank you. <laughs>